Check, 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 I'm good. So I'm Max Ron, Max, Max Ron, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Welcome to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Seron, as always, with you guys for another incredible, entertaining, and fun show. Today, we have someone who actually reached out to us and said, hey, I listen to your show. How do I get on your show? Well, that's the way you get on our show. You just ask. So we got Manuel Castillo with us today. He is of Honduran descent, and he lives here in Canada, and he is a welder. Welcome, Manuel. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Glad to be here. So you, I see in your on your on your little media thing here. It says Mano. So do people call you Mano? Yeah, it's been my nickname for a long time. It's uh, it's something that I I got back in the days when I lived in Winnipeg. Uh, it's kind of a, a staple that every Winnipeg street hooligan has a nickname. So, so are you Mano, like as in Hermano, or Mano as in like Mano del Diablo? Mano as in like the hand. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh yeah, I don't know. You know what? I think my brother my brother did give give it to me. He gave it to me a long time ago and it kind of comes from uh Scarface. If you remember the scar the movie Scarface, Manolo was uh mm-hmm. Scarface's uh, side you know sidekick. And uh that time when uh, he was gonna shoot the cop, the crooked cop, he was like, Hey Mano, shoot this piece of shit. And anyway, it kind of just <laughs> that was a long time ago now, right? So you guys have probably said that to each other a hundred thousand times in your yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah, he said it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. So where are you? You said you were you got your nickname in Winnipeg. Where do you live now? Uh now I'm in Brockville or or in the surrounding area of Brockville. Um What's, where's which Brockville? Is, which is uh it's east of toronto four and a half okay. east of toronto yeah so why did you Ottawa. why did you leave winnipeg oh uh you know it kind of goes back to just in winnipeg i i had a reputation of just doing just shady stuff right mm-hmm. i was uh, i was a, the street you know hanging on and uh really kind of going nowhere right i was just always getting in trouble and i i needed to kind of get out of the norm you know, my norm of just being surrounded by the same people that I grew up with and, and being surrounded doing the same things I was doing, it just wasn't going anywhere. So I kind of made it like an executive decision to pack up and just, just roll out and try something new. So and were I, you, were you born in Winnipeg or were you born like in, in Central America? So no, I was born in Honduras and mm-hmm. I was there for two years. So at the age of two, I left Honduras and mm-hmm. then from there we moved to Texas. So I lived in Texas for five years in houston okay yeah and uh, a lot of my family's still there now a lot of my, yeah. my dad's brothers and sisters are still there yeah. and why why do you guys decide to leave texas uh you know what it's probably a, a deeper political reason i think there's something, something to do with um a, a living visa i mean we left honduras because of the the uh, civil war mm-hmm. right so the, the united states took us in as a uh, you know kind of Re- exiled ref- refugees yeah that's right yeah. political refugees and um and I think our time was just up, right? Yeah. And so we uh, we moved over to Winnipeg, where my mom's yeah. parents were, and uh, and okay. just trying to start over there. Yeah, no, I love Winnipeg. I think Winnipeg gets a rough, a rough. I don't know. People don't seem to like Winnipeg outside of Manitoba. People make fun of Winnipeg, and I always tell people that if they don't like Winnipeg, they haven't spent enough time there because. The art scene's cool. The music scene's cool. The architecture, the Forks area is beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit rough, but I'm a little bit rough, so I kind of like that, you know. Like, yeah, you know, you'll, you'll, you're gonna find trouble anywhere you go, but you're totally right. The Forks is awesome. The people there are super nice. You know, mm. it says it on the license plate, "Friendly Manitoba," and and mm. everybody gets along. You're really, really, they're really cool people, right? Uh, and you're gonna find trouble no matter where you go. So if you're looking for it, you're definitely gonna find it in the peg. Um, mm-hmm. but I mean, for the most part, Winnipeg was awesome. I loved it. I actually do miss it a lot. I have a lot of friends out there now. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I, at the jump of a hat or I would love to go and visit. Right. And, mm-hmm. uh, go back there and do it all over again. I got awesome memories, you know, I, from being so young and going through different high schools and then trying to transition from a teenager to a, a grown man, you know, just 
it's it's interesting, right? Like, I mean, it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was awesome. I, I loved it. Was, How do you tell people that you're bad without saying you're bad? When I went through a whole bunch of different high schools. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> generally, most only go to one. Just it, saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, Winnipeg was awesome. So how old were you when you left Winnipeg? I was 22. So yeah. you were already welding by then? Yeah, I was welding. I, I actually went to went to welding school in Winnipeg. So I went to South Tech, and they called it South Tech Technical College at the time, back in uh, 96, I think I started. And uh, and yeah, so I went to South Tech. I love South Tech. It was so much fun. The course was awesome. It was two years long. Um, two years? Oh, wow. That's serious. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was it went from everything, from oxyacetylene you know, all the way to stick, and then MIG, and then it finished off with TIG. A lot of hands-on, a lot of... Uh, tool training all right and um mm-hmm. a lot a lot of math right you had to go into everything so they did a great job of teaching and i remember my teacher his name was larry he was long-haired looking like a biker blonde-haired guy hilarious mm-hmm. right and, uh, and he was super smart super cool and he, and he could weld man it was awesome so it, he made it fun they all made it fun it, they, they made it interesting and, and easy to get along with and easy to go and want to try and do things right yeah now when you were a kid growing up in winnipeg did you kind of think you were kind of heading towards the trades or or you know like i know i'm an immigrant my mm-hmm. dad was in the trades it was always like you're not going to be in the trades you gotta go to university you're gonna have to be i mean my mom was so hung up on like me being a doctor or a lawyer or these cliche rich people yeah. jobs right that uh, i had no I intention mean, I thought it was a Spanish person thing. I mean, it seems like every time I talked about, you know, education and or heard education in the family growing up, it was always doctors and lawyers and architects. And that was yeah. it, right? <laughs> or, or engineers, right? So, yeah. Um, you know what? As far as me wanting to be in the trades, I don't think I ever really decided that I, that I wanted to be a welder. I mean, when I was little, little, when I was a kid, I, I helped my dad with, with uh, mechanics and and I was good with my hands and I'd work on my own bike and I'd sand down for bike frames. And I was always the one cutting the grass. I was physically in good shape, mm-hmm. you know, and I like working with my hands and I knew that I was, I was good at it. Just anything to do with my hands. But, um, as far as being a, a kid, I, I never actually thought it through. And you know what, there, there was a moment where I was in grade, uh, grade 10 and I was in my shops class mm-hmm. and there was a, uh, there was an old go-kart, right? motorized go-kart in the shop and it was just sitting there and i was like so i, I asked my my teacher at the time i was like well what's up with that go-kart is it does it run he says well the motor everything's fine with it but the frame's broken so and i was like well how do you fix it um, and it was actually yeah. at that moment where he said well you got a weld and i was like well what's that and that let's was it that. Oh, yeah that was it let's do that like i mean i want that go-kart i want to ride it what do we do let's do this and yeah that's exactly what we did we 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 big welded the frame of the, the go kart and uh, I don't even remember driving it, but I mean that, that was it. Right? <laughs> Probably just forgot all about it when it was done, right? Yeah, it's like oh, girls. <laughs> <laughs> so, look at what I can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So were you no. kind of hooked at that point? Like, I mean, grade ten, that's fifteen years old. Uh, you kind of yeah, you know, touch Absolutely. welding and, and that's it. That at that point. The rest of your two years of high school, and well, if you if you finished high school, were you focused on like you know this is I think what I'm going to do? It, you know what? It's exactly how it happened. Okay, uh, so I, I did that, and when uh, me growing up, I I was good at I was good at a couple of things, and uh, one was being I was in good shape, and uh, and I loved running, playing sports, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of football, and two, I was uh, I was good at fighting. <laughs> okay. So yeah. those two things were what I had. And when I discovered that I was good at welding, it was it became a third. So yeah. that third thing, which now was something that actually meant something more important than enjoying weekend football and, and getting into trouble, mm-hmm. that probably became something like, hey, man, well, this is probably important. You should probably pay attention. You're good at this. So I told my dad and I said, dad, I think I think I want to be a welder. And that, that was the key word, I think, right? I mean, I'm good at this. So so far, I've proven that I can do this. My teacher said I was good at it. Give it a try. So I told my dad, and my dad kind of said, "Okay, well, he saw the the passion that I already had. Mm-hmm. And it, even that simple fact, it was just something I was interested in." And uh, and he said, "Okay, well." So we talked me through it. He said, "You know that as a welder, you're going to be doing some physical labor. You know, you're going to get dirty sometimes. 
You're going to have to do some lifting, some stuff. And it, it basically is saying you're not going to be a lawyer. You're not going to be a doctor. You're not going to wear a fancy suit or, or, a, or a tie. And I said, okay, well, okay, let's do it. So we signed, my, we, we signed up. And actually in grade 11, I was signed up. And the school mm -hmm. I went to, they paid for, uh, for me to go to tech college. And for those two years, for grade 11 and grade 12, for the afternoons, I would go to uh, South Tech, um, South Winnipeg Technical College, and I would do my welding course there. That sounds like an awesome program. It was awesome, man. It was, uh, you know, I don't remember what it cost. It didn't cost me anything, but I don't remember what it cost them. But they covered the cost, and and I loved everything. They covered transportation, all the training, and it included a, it went towards my credits as mm -hmm. well. So I graduated high school um, with all the credits I needed. I graduated high school now as a certified welder because I graduated from South Tech College. And, uh, and as soon as I graduated grade 12, I was ready to hit the workforce. Man, that sounds great. Now, 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 were you ready in your head to go I, hit the workforce? Like, I mean, one thing to have a couple tickets in your back pocket and someone says go be a welder. But, you know, 18 years old, full of ambition and, you know, all these ideas, you're still, maybe you're smarter than I am, but at 18 years old, I still just wanted to party, even though I was welding and making money. I mean, thank God welding gave me the opportunity to live my lifestyle and still have cash because if it was a minimum wage job, there's no way I would have been able to do it. Like, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely <laughs> right, man, uh, for sure. And, and the the parting definitely got in the way, right? I mean, yes, I finished it. You know, the truth is, when I was there, I, I loved it, man. And and I and I I think I was I was really good at it. Okay, and I'm mm -hmm. gonna, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I picked up the welding and I just had a niche for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Started from oxyacetylene all the way, and then when I got to the TIG, I was like, this is much better. So yeah. I, I didn't I didn't like MIG, I didn't like stick, I didn't like the, the sparks, the, the smoke, the loud, the the spatter. And then I got to the TIG, which was the last six months of the two years, and I loved every minute of it. So yeah. in my mind, I was gonna I I, I wanted to do TIG, and and that's what I really liked, and I was and I was good at it, and it felt comfortable. But the school decided to do a placement, a work placement after I graduated, and they put me in a in a I guess it was like a it was called Bueller Manufacturing. I think they made farm equipment or large, large farm equipment, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, in, industrial equipment, right? Heavy, heavy, yeah. heavy steel. And it was like 99% MIG and yeah. very rare part of the building was some stick. And honestly, when I graduated and I was positioned there and I was making, I think it was like $11 and 30 something cents an hour yeah. after two years. And then I was doing this and I was MIG welding and I was doing heavy steel, doing exactly what I didn't want to do. Uh, my heart just just sank, man. I, I felt horrible. I felt like this has been a big mistake. Yeah. And, and I regretted every minute of it. But I, I went and I stuck with it for a few months at Bueller. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, you know what the truth is? I, I, I quit. I quit Bueller. I couldn't take it. So I had to reevaluate what I just did, what, I, what I've done. Two years of welding. And I'm only making like at that time, I think minimum wage was like six fifty, right? So um I I in my mind thought I'm gonna be a welder and making big bucks right away. So when I graduated <laughs> my course, I'm making eleven dollars an hour. Pure regret, right? <laughs> and you know, I don't know who puts that into kids' minds. There's no job, any job that makes big money right out the gate. None. Not even a doctor, not even a lawyer, none. Like it no, just, that's no. not a thing that's real. I think Hollywood, Hollywood tells people that you, you know, Doogie Hauser finishes school at 15 and he's a millionaire next year. That's not a thing, man. Doogie Hauser had a $300,000 student loan and, uh, like, I mean, he's screwed. TV show. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, so, so like, I mean, it's a crazy idea and, and it's about the same now. So now minimum wage in the country is anywhere between like 11 and 15 bucks and starting wage for welders is anywhere from like 20 to 25. So it's still just about double minimum wage. Yeah. And most people would die for double minimum wage. But yeah. welders, and I mean, I taught for almost 10 years. It was like these kids come out of school and they're like, I'm going to go make 50 bucks an hour. It's like, dude, yeah. like, I just crossed the $50 an hour threshold. And I've been doing this like 20 years. Like, what are you <laughs> talking about? You're going to make 20 and you're going to shut up. You're like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You better get dirty too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because now I got the take job in the back with the three of us, you know, old that's guys. It. And you yeah. guys can haul material like a bunch of chumps, you know, like. There you go. You got to figure it out, man. 
Well, that's just the, it's the progression of industry. And honestly, when you come out of school for as much, as awesome as everyone thinks you are, and I've seen some amazing students like day one, never even seen a welder. They just get it. Just like a yeah. light turns on in their head. They're just amazing. They get the puddle, they get the angle, they get it. It's like an art. They just, it falls into place. They're still not worth more than anybody else the day they graduate. That's right. Yeah. Right. Like, you you know, you, years underneath your belt. Yeah. You got to prove it to somebody. I mean, yeah. You can prove it to me. I'm your teacher. I'm not paying you. Like you're paying uh, me. So like, yeah. Yeah. let's see how that works out for you. And some of them crumble under the pressure, man. Some of them really, what happened to you? They really lose confidence. They get discouraged. They thought they would go out there and be a hot shot right away. And that's just not a thing. Like you yeah. just got to put the time in and that's. Completely discouraged, man. I was, and it's I was, funny. I'm... It's funny because what you described as discouraging sounded like what I exactly what I love to do. I love thick plate, heavy industrial yeah. work. That's my jam. The yeah. bigger, the better. Like if this thing weighs on a hundred tons, I'm on it, man. And give me a scaffold and I'll put this thing and I'll put this, you know, 60 by 40 by 30 with 600 parts. I'll build the whole damn thing within a 16th of an inch. And I'm going to nail it, man. That's my that's, jam. And most you. people hate that work. There you go. I see you and I are the complete opposite. You know what? I know you don't like any of the creativity, the art, the art side of it. You're like, I just don't get it. And I've heard you say yeah. it. You, I've heard you say, I just don't get it. I don't have, you want me to build you a box? I'll build you a box. You want a tank? I'll build you a tank. You want to build something abstract? I have no idea. But that, and I'm the opposite, right? I like, I like the arts. I like the abstract. I like the, you mm -hmm. know, I, it's funny. I, I build a lot of boxes now, but, but yeah, no, I, I couldn't take it, man. I, did, I didn't like the, the MIG. I didn't like the, the environment. It was, very, it was way too, it was way too industrial for me. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's a whole different vibe. It's a whole yeah. different vibe, and I get it. I remember the first shop job I got at a small, thin metal, gauge metal, stainless, you know, aluminum alloys shop. I only lasted, I think, a year and a half there. And I was like, hey, I just, I just yeah. can't get into this. And I got really good at TIG. Well, I wouldn't say really good. Pretty good at TIG at that shop. But it's really the only TIG job I've ever had in my life, and I've never looked for another one. I was like, I'm good with that. You know, that's it. I'm moving on. Now, you said you really love TIG. Were you able to start finding TIG work? Because that's tricky in Canada. You know what? I did. I did. And yeah. uh, it, it wasn't too long after I left them. Uh, after I did my, my reevaluating and uh, I picked myself back up, I found a company. It was called Metal Tech Industries. And they were all TIG, right? It was awesome. all TIG. And we did a lot of, a lot of uh, I guess, uh, trays or framework mm -hmm. for maple leaf meats. Which I guess so would food to... production, food storage. Yeah, right? that's exactly what I did at that company with TIG. It was all food or lab or kitchen equipment. You know, that, and I love that stuff. Yeah, you, you, that, you didn't you didn't like it, eh? Well, it's okay. Like, look at it this way. Let's say I got, uh, you know, ten feet by three feet strip of half inch plate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I got it just like, just in a simple concept, I just got to tack it together like a T on top of another plate the same size. Right. Now, if this thing doesn't line up, I can easily push it, push it, push it, line because steel's never straight, right? You got to, right. you got to get your points across, tack it in. You got to watch how it pulls and line mm -hmm. it up straight and get it in there. And then you can, you know, jump your welds around and you can end up with a straight plate. Right. Now try doing that with 22 gauge. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the world I like. Right. And it's like, you got to be so careful and slow and precise and then a one bad weld this thing warps and you can't just unwarp it because it's so thin that it actually warps the material like inherently and you can't hammer that now because the hammer is just gonna ruin it yeah. so it's like for me i was just like oh man like i got like monkey fingers or something it's just like Doo <laughs> like just, I don't know. right yeah and you love that i love it and uh and that's exactly what i do now Mm -hmm. I, I, and I have, and I've always, you know what, after that one job with the, with the MIG and I, and I left it, uh, I found TIG and I've never looked back. No, I, that's, I, that's been your gig the whole time. That's it. I, I specialized for the last 25 years in stainless steel, sanitary food grade, TIG welding, um, in fabrication or process piping. Um, I, I love it. I, I love everything about Stainless, I can't stand carbon steel. It makes me emotionally, it makes me feel gross. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like an absolute diva when it comes to take and stainless. And that's, that's just the bottom line. It's true. I, I know it's, uh, 
yeah, it's it is. It's an it is. art, man. So I'm a stainless freak. My career was mainly stainless. That's what I specialized in. But stainless stick, MIG, and flux core. Yeah, right. yeah. So like just the other spectrum of stainless. So uh, you know, heavy plate, stainless plate, which is not easy to work on, right? And it's a whole other game getting into one inch thick stainless plate. Like number one, that's so expensive. Very rarely will you ever even see stainless wow. job that I've expensive. Never seen a one inch thick stainless plate. <laughs> yeah. So like when you're working in mining, deep mining, hardcore drilling stuff, that stuff is all heavy stainless plate because it won't corrode, right? And right. Uh, so like you, but you still need the strength. Uh, and just the weight because mining you actually need weight because just the machine's tool is not enough to dig into the ground the machine itself needs to be heavy enough to contribute to the dig you know what i mean it'd be putting like a dry drill on the front of a honda civic it'll the honda civic is just going to be hanging on the back of that you want to so put that weight, and then you have hardened bits like i guess like really like... yeah yeah there'll be either a titanium or a, or a cast just... alloy yeah, and then you'll 309 them on, you know, because 309 is what you use to mix uh, the mix. So I had my three. I mean, this is back in the day. Now there's different. Now they're just classification tickets. But I used to have to carry a 308, 309, 316, 324 in all the processes. So I was like 30 some tickets just to have just to have a job. Now you just get your stainless F4 or whatever it is, and see you later, right? Or no F. Yeah. What is it? You what know what? I, I sit there. I say yeah, but I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to ticket, and, and that's the thing, my my, uh, my trade as far as TIG goes and food food grade, mm -hmm. and uh, it's I really require very few tickets. I mean, yeah, I just it's, need, it's uh, not pressurized, right? So it's not load bearing. It's not structural. No, no structural. I did pressure vessels, pressure vessels uh, for for a well, for a while as well, but that was just because when I wasn't doing sanitary piping on site, I'd go back to the shop and I'd help the guys build some stainless steel pressure vessel tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, for dairy plants and, and any, anything, right? All those food grade places. But for the most part, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of the guys that are Red Seal and I commend them. For all the training and, and all the, the tests and search that they have to go through and the processes and the steps. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Like that's a lot. Well, those guys have and it's grow. discouraging to fail because like, I mean, you Absolutely. see people that are amazing welders walk into a test and fail and it kills you because it's just you well, well and 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 you, it could be the smallest mistake like i mean sometimes and sometimes it's not even a mistake dude sometimes it's your own mind like some people just yeah. don't test well some people yeah. have anxiety issues i have anxiety issues i take medication for it you know like when i was younger i'd go in to get it to do a well test i'd be like shaking before a test this is when yeah. i'm young and i just thought oh whatever just tough it out hangover? I, I, well that <laughs> Well, no, and you know, you're not lying because you self-medicate, right? You self-medicate when you're young yeah. and you're too stupid yeah. to go to a doctor. So you're just like, oh, I'll just drink till I feel normal. Right. <laughs> 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 well, I grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan, dude, and it's just as rough here. Go. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, well, actually, holy shit, we're at 23 minutes already. Let's take our break and we'll come back. Right. So I want to hear about what you're doing in your career now in Brookville. Brookville, right? Is what you said? Brookville. Brockville, okay, I wrote that yeah. down. Brockville. All right, so for all the listeners, keep following us. This is a really interesting story we got here with Mano, and we'll be right back after these commercials on the CWB Association podcast. And we're back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron, and we have Manuel Castillo here, and he's telling us about his journey in the welding trades. And we're kind of bouncing off. He's a stainless guy. I'm a stainless guy, but he's a thick guy, and I'm like a stick mick guy. And it's like, but, but you know, we need all of us. We need all of us out there, Absolutely. right? Everybody in the trades is important. And even, and I can't stress this enough to my listeners, because I know most of the welders on the planet statistically are manufacturing welders that are on the mig every day mad respect for what you guys do just saying that a lot of people put you down or say how can you do that i could never do that same part every day you know what i need i need you we all need you you Absolutely. build my window frames and my tables and my things that i use every dang day the things i build very few people use because they cost too much <laughs> you know what i mean like you can't have a structure without a structure uh, well guy that built structures right <laughs> <laughs> That probably wasn't the smartest thing I've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Everyone will, everyone will jump over it later. Don't worry. Who was that guy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you said you left for Brockville, um, which is, you said, four hours east of Toronto at around 
22. So you're about five years into the trades. It sounds well, like you. No. So, so I left Winnipeg at 22 and then I moved to the GTA in, in Mississauga. Okay. 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 So you left Winnipeg to Mississauga at how old? At about 22. Yeah. Okay. So you were in the trades about five years there. Why did you leave? Sounds like you had a pretty sweet gig. In uh, in Winnipeg? Yeah. You said you got uh, into the stainless work there or the TIG work. I, I did. It was it, it was just because I spent my money the way that you would think you would spend it on beer mm -hmm. and nothing to show for. And I was just yeah. kind of repeat repeatedly getting a paycheck and just partying. That that's really what I did, right? Mm -hmm. I had a great group of friends who really supported me in causing trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was it, man. So so I was going nowhere, right? And at the time mm -hmm. I had a girlfriend and you kind of want to have that mentality where you want to grow up a little bit and maybe process the idea of having a future and just uh, having you know, some yeah. stuff too, some of yeah, your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't have something to show for, you know, or, mm -hmm. or even a plan. There was no plan. It was just basically just paycheck party and repeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to leave. I just kind of said, okay, this, this is, you know, I, I felt like I was kind of drowning, right? Like it was just like a, like a sand pit. So I, mm -hmm. I picked up and went over to Mississauga. And, so uh, why why Mississauga? You know, when you're looking at the map of Canada, what what drew you to Mississauga area? Um, you know what, a friend, uh, my best friend, when I grew up, who my best friend who I grew up with, he moved that way, and we were still um, talking a lot. We were still mm -hmm. really good friends, and uh, he was one of the guys that was always with me. We grew up together and was causing the same trouble. We were we were part of the same crew, and and he left, and it kind of just seemed like you know what, it. it Either I go east or I go west, right? And I thought BC was going to be pretty expensive, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't know anybody, so I thought I go east where I do know my, my somebody, my, yeah, yeah, somebody, right? And um, and I could try to start there, right? And it's it's good to have some sort of somebody to talk to, right? Somebody to oh, for sure, yeah. And and that's what I did. So I moved down to Mississauga and I jumped right into more stainless uh, sanitary, and I was building. Uh, building some uh, some tanks, some stainless steel tanks. Uh, again, all TIG welding, all stainless, and uh, and it was a great spot. Loved it. And then I just kept on getting more experience, more experience, better and better at it. It became, you know, there was other places that were offering better pay. And, mm -hmm. and it's constantly, you're uh, you know, as a Spanish kid, your your parents are always and just like, and I think you said it too, Max. It was one one of the last podcasts I heard. Where was that? Um, as a Spanish immigrant, you're constantly trying, your parents are constantly trying to one up themselves. Mm -hmm. Always like we moved so much. Like I tell you, I probably moved about 20 something times and it was always an upgrade. Mm -hmm. right? Dad always wanted to get a bigger house or a better car or a better location or better school. And it never ended. I think I kind of got that same mentality. So when I was at that one place in Mississauga, I, I found another one that was bigger, better known better reputation and better pay mm -hmm. so i jumped ship and i went over there and uh and in mississauga i stayed there for 15 years 15 or 16 years wow in, in saga and i bounced around there quite a bit and uh, again did a lot of traveling with this company so a little a lot of process piping a lot of plants a lot of dairy plants food plants candy plants chocolate plants ice cream plants beer plants whatever any, anything food grade mm -hmm. oh, and, uh, medicinal right so i did a lot of pharmaceutical plants uh, and uh, and I traveled a lot of Canada with this company. Yeah, and that's nice, clean work. You know, new materials, everything's clean. I mean, the level of finish people don't really understand, like the 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 level of technique that has to be used, and even just set up deburring, no sharp edges, cotton glove treatment, nothing can exactly. snag, no undercut whatsoever because that's all bacteria corners those are areas that can hold you know anything everything's right. going to be like just perfect right yeah everything is technical like from the purge gas right mm -hmm. that, like you said you can't have any undercuts so the purge gas has to be right it's got to be completely purged of all oxygen and all these these transfer lines they uh they have to be perfectly fit mm -hmm. so i was i was suited for that kind of work you know the the finicky finesse work precision work and I don't like getting dirty, so that really helped out. <laughs> it's all brand new piping, completely coming out of a plastic wrap. And in these plants, they're all, you know, booties and hair nets. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you know, blue cards and red cards and, you know, zones you can go in and zones you can't go in. 
and, and it was high security, right? High quality. And the engineers are always involved. So we're, we're, we're definitely under a, a scrutinous eye, I guess, if that sounds mm-hmm. right. But they're always watching you. And I, I didn't mind because our company, it was, it was a, it's a well-known one across uh, in the industry. And we, when we showed up, we, they knew who they hired and they knew that the bill was going to be big and they knew they were spending a lot of money, but they were expecting good quality. And we, as a team and everybody employed at, uh, at that company, it was almost like a, uh, almost like a, a requirement where you expected the red carpet to get rolled out when we showed up and mm-hmm. we looked at each other and we just said, let's go. And yeah. expected perfection from each from from one another and we all worked really fast and we all worked really well and we expected to knock it out and we're so, we were always constantly on each other's backs like what can i do to make it go faster what do you need help with where, where can i be and we were a really work well, well rounded machine and which really made that industry a lot of fun because you felt it's, like it's them. so important <clears throat> that that level of support within a team but also of of like respectful competition oh it was bad. you know and that's something that's very important in the trades and sometimes gets toxic some guys or i shouldn't say guys some people in the trades will be like welders are competitive it's part of our industry yes that's true it, it makes you a better welder to be competitive but being an asshole is not part of the deal yeah right you can it's like it's like haven't you ever played sports playing sports is where you learn to be competitive without being a jerk you know, exactly. because if you're a jerk, you're not a team player. You're causing no problems. Team. Yeah, no one wants to play with you, right? Yeah. But if you're a good player and you're supportive of your team members, if you're willing to take an assist as well as a goal or make a block as well as a hit, then everyone's going to need you and want you and treat you right. And it's exact same in the welding floor. If you're a part of a tight team and you all are pushing each other to be better, kind of competing with each other, yeah. you get in a vibe. It just feels good being like, you're like, hey, come look at this weld. And then you're all like, hold oh, Man, that exactly. looks great. That looks great. And then you go back to your little work job and you're like, oh man, I got to do better than that guy now. Like I can't have him show me up. You know, that's yeah, a great we, feeling. We, it is a great feeling. And you know, it, it, it was a great feeling for all the years that I was with them. And, and that built, built something in me that kind of, uh, I want and I expect from other people and I, and I want to recreate it everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, you have to kind of, uh, like you said, you have to be, you have to be able to put in the work but also put in the skill and you, mm-hmm. and you have to get that in return and give it back as well. So yeah. I'm, I'm not constantly criticizing somebody. I'm more I'm trying to figure out what they need to get to that level that I want them to be at. So if I'm working with somebody, I'll encourage them or I'll, or I'll teach them what to do, or, or I'll even have to go and play some mind games and be like, well, that's, that looks great. Even though it might not look great because you'll want to show me up after I tell you it looks great. You want to repeat that even better and better and better and better. So it was it was awesome, man. I I loved the sanitary uh, experience, traveling and going across Canada and the United States. And so you've been talking about this company, this 15, 16 year company in the past tense. Yeah. So you were in Mississauga working for this company. It sounds like it was a really good crew. What happened? I I met my wife, and we. <laughs> you know what? I, I met my wife, and I continued working with with that company for uh, a few years while we were the, you know, still in, in the, I guess, I don't dating know stage. Yeah. yeah, kind of dating, but we, we knew each other well enough. We wanted to, we, we were in love right away. My wife and I, we got married about a year after we met. Mm-hmm. And um, we had a, we had a baby. And when my baby was born, my first, I had already been living out of a hotel in, in, in Brandon, Manitoba for a few months. Mm-hmm. And I was only coming back every second weekend for three days. And this was common, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so this kind of lifestyle was great while I was by myself and while we were still, you know, dating and still pretty early. But it started to get real old once I became a father. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, I kind of just said, you know what, this is it was great. I, and I and I learned a ton. And then I said, I think I'm ready to find somewhere where we can settle down a little bit. And honestly, the real estate market in Toronto was just out of my reach. I couldn't, uh, I mean, the down payment was just huge to, to try to buy a house down there. And we were already renting and renting and, and it was just a lot of money, right? It was just, yeah. so we decided to move away from Toronto and my, my career, my, my training and my skill, I could go anywhere. 
right? And uh, and I'm sure with a lot of welders, we can just pack up and we can roll out. We can go anywhere we want in the world and we'll, we'll be employed. Mm-hmm. So I knew that, that that I didn't have to worry. So that's what I did. I picked up and I said, okay, well, I'm going to come around this area. And my brother was in this area. So at least, again, I had somebody, right? So my brother was around and I came out here and I found a company that uh, that I thought would work. And I started working with them. And then I brought my wife over. And uh, and I've been I was employed with uh, two different companies while I was down here. And uh, I showed them a lot of things that they had never seen before. I brought a lot of the skills from from my experience mm-hmm. to this area where I still think there's they're they're behind about ten years out here, and they're they're learning a lot of things, which makes me really um, makes me um, useful, I guess. Yeah, like you you could be someone they can lean on. Right, and so I did. I came out here and uh, and I joined a couple companies, and uh, they were there were some good things about them, some bad things about them, some things that I had a hard time with because if uh, go back to what we were discussing, where you have that camaraderie of skill and and that passion for your job right mm-hmm. it, I, I wasn't really finding it it was difficult to find it because there wasn't a lot of food grade out here right mm-hmm. so i kind of did, I did have to jump into some of the i guess uh fabrication a little bit more dirty jobs a little bit more dirty you know i i, mm-hmm. I did run the stainless steel portion of, of the shops um for the most part and there were i still wasn't exactly doing a ton of sanitary right so i, I had to transition once again which is totally fine because I, I didn't, it's not like I don't know how, and, and I, I did yeah. know how, and I was able to, to quickly learn because of uh, just skills that I've already had kind of practiced growing up. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so I I, um, I did what I could for them. And I had to go again, adjust and find a better suit where I was being, I was happier. So yeah. I worked at different places out here. And the, honestly, the last place the, where I'm at right now is interesting because I no longer do fabrication. I don't work for a shop. I now work for the union, the the piping union, and I work at a stainless steel piping plant in Brockville, where I just weld stainless steel uh, pipe, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, <laughs> I mean, it's it's completely where I, I never thought I'd be doing that, <laughs> right? But I, I did it because once again the pay is so much more and the work is yeah. so much less. And I'm I'm 42 right now, yeah. and I thought, well, but um, I don't mind making like an extra thirty thousand dollars that you know overnight, and I work a lot less, and I'm only working four days a week, and uh, and I get paid weekly, which is always a good thing too. I don't know if you've ever had weekly pay, but weekly pay. Yeah, is all. most of the unions every, every, are weekly pay. So yeah, so. Along with that, um, you know, there was a funny situation where I got laid off because of COVID. And this was about uh, just a few few months back last summer. And uh, there was a shortage of, of work. And the piping plant laid me off for three months. And during those three months, well, a l- little backtrack here. I, I hired or I kind of interviewed a guy who uh, worked at one of the shops that I was at before. And I knew right away that this, this kid had had a talent. And... He, he was he had a stainless steel sanitary background and I was in charge of interviewing and when I interviewed him I told my boss at the time hire him no questions about it just bring him in you we, we need him you want him he's perfect for to have on whatever it is that you're, you're doing right yeah. so he left okay and then I went and worked at the pipe plant he actually worked at the pipe plant too so now we were working <laughs> together at this pipe plant and we were both laid off at the same time and um we just kind of said at one point, you know what? It's uh, we're both obviously not doing anything tomorrow, so let's go golfing and let's let's just have a good golf game and maybe we'll discuss some business. And that's what yeah. we did. We went golfing. We discussed the option of starting our own business, and that's exactly where I'm at right now. So I work full time at uh, at the piping plant four days a week. He and I have started our own shop, and on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays we work full time doing. Um, our projects out of our shop, fabricating and uh, and doing all types of stuff out of that. So, so have you guys got full legit registered name, the whole deal. Everything is going there. Everything's everything's going. We're registered. We have insurance. We have a building. We have uh, strong contracts. We have strong clientele. Um, I was doing stainless steel syrup pens mm-hmm. for the last five years as a hobby out of my garage, and so I kind of built a business out of that, um, and I took that with me to our shop. So now we yeah. already have a good base of of steady work per year, because the the, the syrup industry out here is it's it's crazy. You know, yeah. so I ship syrup pans all across Canada, 
And uh, just because I was looking for something to fabricate because of the TIG experience, I kind of moved out here and I said, hmm, what, what do you guys want? So that's what I did. I created a Kijiji app. Right? Well, and the interesting thing about entrepreneurial work of any kind, and I, I know I've said this on a million shows because I want everyone to start their own business at some point. I think it's just, it's a wonderful experience whether it works for you or not. Um, and not all businesses succeed forever, but even it, if it's a couple years of your life, it, you'll never regret it. But no matter what you build, it'll sell, right? It's just a matter of how well you build it. That's what it is. Because it doesn't matter what it is. You can wake up tomorrow and be like, I want to make uh, barbecue steaks. Okay, fine. Yeah, there's a bazillion barbecue steaks out there. I can go to Home Depot and get a barbecue steak right now. But if you make one that's unique and it's useful and you put it up on Kijiji or Etsy or Shopify, or, dude, it's the internet. It's 2022. You can sell it a bazillion ways. Uh, and you can take a picture of it, put it up. And if you make it cool and nice and unique, you'll sell it. Someone will buy it. And if you make a hundred of them, you'll sell a hundred of them. It's all up to you whether you want to devote that time that commitment and like commit to the brand and the brand is you, right? Like you're, you're the brand. That happened over here because when I, when I started doing man of steel and maple syrup pans, um, I, I designed a pan myself. I, I had seen designs and I, I, I the concept was simple. You, you mm -hmm. need a box to boil uh, sap in, and that was it. But I wanted to build something knowing that the structure and the design I built would be efficient and, uh, and sound and that it would show some sort of skill and not just the skill, but it would show uh, aesthetically, it was really nice to look at. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I just, uh, I started building the pans and the pans, the pan thing just blew up. Honestly, it was overnight. And my wife and I were just like, what is going on? The, the Kijiji, I just kept on going and dinging and dinging and dinging. And before I knew it, I was, I was building 30 pans uh, during the, during the winter months. And, and it just kind of just kept on going and snowballed into something. Right. And that was just a hobby. And, and it still is a hobby, but it's actually, uh, the the background and the base of what our business is built around, uh, you know, it's as funny as it may be. It's it's just syrup pans, and they're all just they're just pans, right? Mm -hmm. But they're 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 more to it now. I mean, now I've gotten to the float boxes and the you know sugar shacks and hoods and everything like that. And if you build it, is, they will come. And that was it, right? <laughs> the business is not just now syrup pans. It's it's everything. We're actually doing um a, a set of handrails for a, a residential apartment building in the town next to us and uh, we hope that that relationship with that construction company just grows into something larger and more and more and more and actually we, we i really have no doubt that it will yeah so it's just a I matter into of that came for a bit to the residential home market and had some fun but i didn't i didn't like it long term i didn't like it long term i, I had some fun but working with home builders is tricky they're a, they're a, the wood construction industry is very different from the steel construction industry, which was what I was more comfortable with. So, I, you know, I had a little bit more, you know, just reservations and it was trickier and people weren't as well organized as I like to be. I find in the steel construction, things are really on schedule, really tight in terms of management. And I got into the home builder game and it was like, yeah, well, when's that job coming up? Eh, like maybe next week or, well, no, maybe three months. Well, well, next week or three months is... Oh, that's not that's not good. way different, man. Like, right? yeah, how long did you do that? For? <laughs> well, I only did it for about two years, and then I was like, no, I don't like it because I've always had my shop. So I was like, you know, you dip into different things. I'm gonna try this for a while. I'm gonna try this for a while. I'm like, ah, no, I didn't like that, or I like that. One of my biggest wins for me is I got into the custom bracket game. People were like, brackets, and that's why I always preach, like, man, build whatever you want, just make sure it's unique. But you know, I saw a need for some cool things and and i got into the brackets things so i built custom tv hangers and audio video bracketry for av companies across canada and so nice. almost like i mean great canadian brew house original joe's all these like chain bars across canada they have like 60 tvs yeah yeah those are my hangers hey and you did yeah. it with a plasma cutter no, I just it's a, it's a design. It's just a different design. I just came up with a whole new design where all the cables run through the center of the post, right? So you don't see all the ugly cables on the outside. Yeah. Right. I, I have a couple access holes cut into the pipe, so and they're both vertical and horizontal build, so they're eight hold, so you can put them on any existing truss of any brand, so they'll fit you know whatever truss. So I went to Home Depot, took pictures of the three or four different trusses that they sell, and made sure that whatever my bolt pattern was would fit either. Right, so that you don't have to buy like the yeah. specific hanger. Just yeah. buy the stupid whatever, and it'll fit whatever. Duh! Like, <laughs> do you still do that? You, do you yeah, still have? Yeah, yeah. Even when I shut down my big shop, I still build those. I'm, that's a contract I'll never give up. Like, I mean, they come back to me every year, twice a year, 
and I get big order, you know, we need 300, 200 twice a year. I'll bring in a couple guys. We'll hammer them out. We all make money for the summer and we go to the lake, you know, like, well, there you go. <laughs> you are a busy guy. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. You know, it's like, uh, sometimes I think about like, you know, what I'm always thinking, what if I lose my job tomorrow? I mean, just the way I think I, I I've bounced around, and, yeah. you know, I, I've, I've only ever been fired once. Thank the Lord, but it could happen. You never know. Recession, something happens, you get laid off. Yeah. It's like, you know, would I go back to making my shop big again? Cause that's always something I could do. I could go rent out another, you know, location and actually get back into it for real. And I don't know if I would, it's a, it's take, it's a lot of work, man. You got a good and, thing now though, don't you? Like working for the CWB. Oh yeah. Like I got, I, I would say I got almost like the best job you could possibly have well, for a, for a dumb immigrant that showed up and only knew how to weld. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. you know it's uh, i love what i do and it's super fun um but i, I do think about ceilings like you said earlier you you want to work somewhere where you feel really good mm. about the, your growth right and right now with cwb i'm growing like crazy i'm learning all new things i'm learning yeah. more about the management the bureaucracy working with like like i mean so like i'm running a multi-million dollar division now yeah, so i've never had to do that before that's a big learning curve learning how to manage that not bad for a welder, hey? No, not bad for a welder. So it's been a lot of fun. But, you know, there's always, like, what if five years from now, ten years from now, I'm like, man, I just want to weld. Yeah. Like, I mean, it could happen. Like, I I do miss welding, right? And and I don't – and welding in my garage, even these contracts I have is fun. But I miss the crews. I miss the, crew, the jobs. Right. I miss the the having the engineers to come down and be like, this is the plan. What do you think? That I, I don't have that anymore, right? Yeah. So that's kind of so sad. You want the problem. Sometimes you get give you a drawing, just go to town and then just just get some work done. See Here's something. your pallet of parts. Here's your drawing. Maybe There's your table part. and your welder. I'll see you tomorrow. I love, I love that. that. <laughs> you know, yeah, G- give me a box of sanitary elbows and five thousand ferrules and five thousand feet of tubing. Just leave me alone. <laughs> I'm good, man. If I have to spin elbows all day long and put ferrules on them for a month, no problem. <laughs> just leave me my turn table, my purge table, and my tri stand, and, and, and I'm good, man. I'm I'm happy there. That's my happy place. Yeah. So, what's your company's name now? What's it called? Uh, so it's Castlemore. Castlemore SPF, and that stands for Sanitary Process Fabrication. So Castlemore is a, a combination of my last name, which is Castillo. And my business partner's last name, which is much more. So much more. Yeah. So he got he got the more, and I got the the castle. So castle, how did you get you know. how did you get the front? Did you guys have to fight over that? Why isn't it more castle? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I think that sounds. I don't know. It, it doesn't work. You know what? Actually, our process lasted <laughs> a long time. It was probably like a good month where we where we sat through because of course when you're thinking of a business, the name. I mean, mm-hmm. back and forth on names all over the place and we had some weird names and i don't even know how honestly i think we just sound, finally said okay look we're going with castlemore that's it print it on a toque and it's done right yeah well my the one company like the one that had big kept biggest for me was called cubed productions like a cube and mm-hmm. it was the three sides welding fab and design right it was like yeah. the the cube and it ran for a long time but then I sold it, and then I we decided to get back. Like I mean, I, you sell your business, and then like eight months later, you're like, I want another one. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's what he keeps saying, right? The, my business partner keeps saying, you know, what, we're gonna do this for ten years and then sell it. And I'm like, okay, well, then we'll you'll s- just start another one. <laughs> that, that's probably what's gonna happen, right? Yeah. So then I started up my next one, and I just wanted to keep it super simple. So I just use my initials. It's just like SMC Fabrication now. Just minus Sebastian Maximiliano said on Fabrication, good enough. What, what, so what's your full name? Is it is it Maximus? No. No, Sebastian Maximiliano Ceron Candia is my full Spanish name. It's so funny. We have like my, my wife's looking at me right now laughing because it's it's such a typical thing for us Spanish guys to have like four hundred names. Yeah, what's your full name? Manuel Alfredo Castillo Molina de Villa. Yeah, there's there you go. It's, it's a yeah. It's normal. It's beautiful. Uh, truth is, I get I get rid of all of them and I just go with Manuel Castillo and that's it. And, no and man, I, I wish I could use all of mine all the time and then I can look at white people and be like, Your names are boring. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Alex. You only got a first and last name. You're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Alex Bob. Cool. Like, yeah. As I get hate mail tomorrow from Alex Bob. Right? I'm like, oh yeah. man, that was I'm mean. Listening right now, they just shut you off. <laughs> 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 so, 
So, you know, it was interesting in terms of when you reached out to me about talking about podcasts and you, you were talking about where you listen to podcasts, you listen to them like at work and listening, yeah. you know, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts just time wise, which is really weird. People are like, you're a podcast, so you don't listen to podcasts. It's like, well, it's like I'm recording them. I don't have as much time to yeah. listen. I, yeah. I'm curious in terms of as a listener, you know, when you're listening to either ours podcast, CWB Association, or others' podcasts, mm -hmm. you know, is there, and this is completely just, I, I'm asking for information, is there like a length that you like, short, long? Do you like them under an hour? Do you like them over an hour? I got friends that do podcast shows, they're like three, four hours long. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I would listen to that. And then I've, I've recorded podcasts that sometimes are only like 35, 40 minutes long, and then I feel like that's too short. What would be the perfect length for you? You know what? It, there's, there are times when I've listened to a, like a two and a half hour podcast and I say to myself, oh man, that's over too bad. Mm -hmm. I, I wish there was more. It all just comes down to the content and the people that are putting on the, the podcast and the conversations that they're having and, and how engaging and, and how engaged I am and how engaged they are in their conversation. Like I can get really, I, I get right into it. And I don't want to. I don't want to promo on any other podcast here, but the Dean Blundell show really is interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's just full of so much drama, right? The drama, <laughs> the hood, right? So if I got the yeah. earbuds in my ears, and 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 I can just I can listen to anything, right? So I, there's times I honestly listen to your podcast, and I'll listen to five six episodes, and then my day's over, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like I'm I'm actually listening to all of yours now, so I'm I'm all out. So now then I listen to other stuff, but. It's all man. Like, we got we got like sixty out there. You already did them all. I've done them all, man. Holy! It's, 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 I'm telling you, it's, I just <laughs> go to town. I have a lot of time under, under the hood. <laughs> yeah, I gotta but, I gotta pump these out faster, maybe. Yes, when you. Were I ready. I do take the summer off though. I do take the summer off. Podcast. There's eight weeks with no podcasts. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's man, a lot. Of I, I'm I'm gone fishing. I got a I got a boat. I'm out of here. Good like, for you. <laughs> yeah, that's good, man. But you're entertaining, so uh, you know that's one of the things that was uh, it was easy to call because I thought you know what you'd be a good conversation. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah, you got, you bring good energy. You ask good questions, and and I was thinking myself, I didn't want it to turn into like just an interview, but rather like a like a good chat. You know what I mean? Well, that's always the gimmick, man. And everyone that comes on the show is always like, "Hey, what questions are you going to ask me?" It's like <laughs> I'm not telling you. I don't even know. <laughs> like I totally just gauge people's personality and listen to what they're saying and. Like, it's like if I went to my friend's house to talk and, like, hang out, I don't show up with a list of questions. Exactly. Right? Like, if you're going to hang out with somebody and get an authentic conversation, then you got to listen. Just listen to what they're saying and reply. We're great. Right? Like, that's it. And you, you got to have the back and forth banter. And you, you got to do it just to, just to chat. And that's why, when, when I, like I said, when I came in and I knew it was going to chat it up with you, I, I've already known a lot about you because you, you like to talk too when you're talking to your, your mm -hmm. guests. You engage on your stories as well, right? So I've heard a lot of things about your. Yeah, I wonder if people getting sick of hearing about my 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 stories. <laughs> you know, one of, these, one of these days you're just gonna have a, a, a podcast where you're just talking all about you. <laughs> right? Oh man, I ha I had someone say that they're like, we need to do a reverse podcast. But like they're like, and this actually I thought you know I actually took this to my staff because I was like, hey, this is not a bad idea. They're like, you should like reach out to all your past guests. And see if they sure. would put questions together or do a podcast where people get to ask me questions, right? And I thought, yeah, hey, that'd be kind of fun, you know, but maybe everyone already knows everything. I don't know. Uh, no, probably not, buddy. I mean, there's a, <laughs> she got quite a long history of work and a lot of interesting stories. So what's your interesting plan now? Where are you going to go? Like, you got the company. You're still working full time. I'd imagine the idea is that you get enough work that you can drop the full time and just run with this. Um, and, this, and, and ride it out. I'm I'm close. I'm close to uh to uh, another another transition, right? Mm -hmm. And that is, uh that has a lot to do with the CWB, because mm -hmm. I run the shop and uh, I am training right now to be the the shop welding supervisor, and for my shop to be CWB certified, which is a requirement from a lot of companies that they want that, mm -hmm. uh, I need to train. I need to pass that CWB supervisor course. So that's in the that's what I'm in the process of right now. So. I've uh, I, I'm doing the online course and I've got all my books and I'm doing a lot of studying right now. I just have about half of the uh, 59.1. Yeah, 59.1. 59.2 is aluminum. Right. So I got a half of the 59.1 left and then I'm going to I'm going to book my appointment for my test. And that'll be probably in the next three weeks. And then what do you think of the course? That, pardon? What do you think of the course so far? It's um, I thought it'd be easy. 
but really, it's, it's not. It's not. No, it's not. I mean, I thought I would challenge it because I can. You know, I got mm-hmm. 25 years experience, and, and I'm, I'm allowed to challenge it. Um, I'm glad I decided not to. I spoke to uh, Kimball, who his name was, but he's a, he's a top dog at CWB, right? And I had a conversation mm-hmm. with him. Cause I called up, I called directly right to the to the big guy there, and, and he told me everything. He kind of said, you know what? Don't if you can afford, do the course, and mm-hmm. uh, and do it that way. It, it, it'll work out for you. You'll want to do that. You don't. I, and I didn't want to go in. A, I didn't want to struggle. And I and I'm still studying, so I'm. You know, I don't think it's going to be easy. And, yeah, uh, if you if you got a pile of cash and you just want to throw it at it, you can just challenge the test and fail, and then just know what you failed, yeah. and then do it again. But that nope, seems nope. like a stupid way of doing it. You know, <laughs> um, it's the course is usually two weeks in person or online. You can stretch it out, but mm-hmm. people don't realize the amount of theory, like metallurgy, you know, like kinetics, physics theory. And I've told this to at the college where I worked. Our boss at the college made it mandatory that all the instructors had to get their level one inspector. Mm-hmm. The supervisor is basically like, I would say half to two thirds of the level one inspector. So, you know, generally I would tell people that are looking to get serious about welding, take the supervisor course. It's a good introductory to how CWB works, like the meat and bones of how we operate. Right. right. It tells you like how the systems work, how the audit process works, what people are looking at, how to, how to ride the line of, cause you, you know, as a company, you got to ride the line between profit and, and safety and all these things. And CWB supports that. The supervisor course gives you just enough training to get that passed, and then it's very good for you. Even if you're never a supervisor, it's just good, good material. The it inspector, is. the inspector side, if you want to take it further in the next modules that go up to inspector, then you get into like a deeper metallurgy, which is fantastic. I'm a metallurgy nut. Yeah, I love that metallurgy stuff. Yeah. Um, so like I tell people, like if you are interested in that, take the level one inspector. Even if you never I have never in my life wanted to be an inspector. I don't want to be a, a, a weld narc. That's not my thing, you know, but <laughs> I, uh, well, <laughs> but I do love learning about it. And you know what, yeah. if you know what an inspector is going to come look at, it sure is a hell of a lot easier to pass. Yeah, you're right, man. You're absolutely right. <laughs> CWB has so much to offer. And I never actually thought about all of the uh, extra, I guess, um, well, just courses and, and uh, mm-hmm. more, more learning, I guess, progress yourself progressive learning until i had to go and do the supervisor test and then i saw all the courses on the cwb and during my career i've never had to do a lot i didn't have to do a lot of search okay i got a lot mm-hmm. of i did a lot of test plates for whatever we were doing at the time and yeah. you can get some uh, some search here and there but i mean nothing like a, like a like a red seal right i mean i, I yeah. never had real real training so i kind of got lucky that way and i and i've been grand, grandfathered into a lot of stuff yeah. because i've been doing it for a long time and, and and I got to give it to those guys that really go through the courses, do all that training. And it never applied to me until right now. This shop requires it. Right. So now yeah. when I'm going through the CWB course and I'm seeing all the extra training, extra training and all the other courses that I can do. I mean, it's 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 really interesting, man. And I really like the idea. I'm really enjoying the course right now. I like the training. Forty two years old. I'm back in school. You know, I'm deep in books and I got highlighters. I think I've burned like three highlighters already. <laughs> so it's just fun, right? It's great. And I'm learning a lot. And once I get this CWB certified sticker on my shop and everything is done and said, and I got my oh. procedures written up. There's man. one right there. I can just send it. No, I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk after the podcast. <laughs> just a strip of them. Hey, buddies. <laughs> yeah. That's right. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, it's lot- you know, it's... uh. I was going to say about the, 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 the education side, and this is going to be my shameless plug now, is that we just rolled out free education for our members. So we just rolled out free courses. For, just at the beginning of, of February, we had our first rollout. So if you go to the association website now, you'll see there's a new thing on the left that says training, upskill, and, and a program. And it's funded by industry and internally for free courses for any member that have to do with welding supports. So it's not welding specific. So this is Excel, PowerPoint, how to write a proposal, how to write a business plan, how to do your taxes, how to do all that stuff that is around welding that you never get a chance to get trained on. And I learned all that stuff the hard way and by paying big bucks to go back to university in my 40s to learn this stuff and and readjust my career to this management world I live in now. But I was like, when I got this job, I was like, you know, I wish I would have had access to this as a kid or even younger, like I started my first business at 25 and it was such a failure. And I was like, man, I wish I would have had some access to some courses. So we just, 
right? Yeah. So now I just, we just rolled that out. We had Excel. This is Excel month. We have intermediate, um, basic, intermediate, and advanced. Intermediate next week. Advances on the twenty eighth. There's free spots, man. Jump in, grab one. Yeah, I'm um, gonna do that for sure. Yeah, like and next that. next month is Women Empowerment Month, but we have I think PowerPoints and then two classes uh, to help. And they're not just for women; they're for men and women. But they're like you know the how to ally with women which is i think important for men like how to make sure you make a workplace comfortable for women because you may not by accident just because the way you were raised or the, your life or you don't know you know and 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 stuff like that so and every month we have something to do with management and every month we have something to do with like a theme of the month so it'll be like women cuz march is international women's day so we decided to support women and then I think we have fa like something with families, and so we have oh no entrepreneurial. So CWB has a sole proprietorship, has inspector, has supervisor. So then we're doing bookkeeping and auditing and stuff like that on the other side for free, right? So that is great, man. I'll look into that right away too. That's awesome. I had no idea. Yeah, no, we haven't really pushed it out hard. Mainly my fault because I have a really I work too fast. I kind of outpace myself. So what happened is I created all these cool things and got all this the cool stuff coming, but it's like I turn into an infomercial. It's like, hey, check out this thing. Oh yeah, and this thing. Oh yeah, and that thing. <laughs> oh, and by the by the time I get to the fifth thing, you already forgot where the first four were. Right. right. So yeah. that's good, man. That's good. <laughs> so now with the company, you know, you're 42. Next 10 years, you're gonna be riding this out, growing growing the brand, getting it out there. You I'm know, tired. are you everybody else a lot of money? That was it. Yeah, and you're gonna retire. You're gonna actually like walk away. You're gonna do it. Uh, no, oh God, I I can't predict the future just yet, yeah, buddy. You know, but there's there's I got I got three little girls. I've got to yeah. like, make sure I make enough money to to support and uh, provide and make sure that they're healthy and safe and happy. And it's just right now, honestly, it's this step of doing what I've always wanted to do, which everybody wants to do, is be your own boss. Mm -hmm. It's just I'm I'm just doing it now. You know you know what I mean? Like I'm just finally yeah, and it can be like, very I'm, overwhelming. I'm doing it. Yeah. Now with your three girls, here's a question for you. And we're, we're about the end of the show here. So this will kind of tail it out. You got three young girls as a dad, as a welder now for your whole life and now a business owner. Would you recommend or steer your girls into the trades? Or are you going to be the typical Latino dad and say, be a doctor or a lawyer? You know what? It's, it's, it's so true. Um, absolutely. Because <laughs> I mean, we, I'm this is something that I I have to deal with as a boss, as CWC guy now. Yeah, less than five percent of the trade is women. I want to see it fifty fifty in the next twenty years. But by the time it, I retire, it and I don't know if it, it it won't happen. No, it won't. But what can I do to to make it as good as possible? And you know, I steered both my kids towards what they wanted. My aunt, my son went into the trades. My daughter didn't. She's a teacher. So it's like, God, dang. But if you were to ask me, like, you know. My, all the, all the instructors and guys I work with and, you know, old farts, we have daughters and it's like, would you tell your daughter to be a welder? And we all have to stop and think about it. But why, why do we have to stop and think about it? Why isn't it something that's like, yeah, I've had a great career. Fantastic. Why wouldn't I want that for my kid? If it's your son, it's like, okay. But if it's your daughter, you're like, nah, why don't you try nursing? I mean, we do the exact same things we're telling other people not to do. You know what? I, I can't say that I wouldn't recommend it or, yeah. or push towards it. I would just, uh, they're learning a different aspect of welding and, and they're learning a different lifestyle of, of, of the word term welding and the career of welding from me mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm not your typical uh, welder. I'm not the, the heavy sparks and fire and, and heavy steel. Uh, they know that daddy does really fine, you know, quiet take welding stuff and it's mm -hmm. all small and thin. So this industry, it doesn't look like a trade. It doesn't look like a, like a heavy steel trade. So mm -hmm. they know when I go to work, I'm not getting dirty. I'm, I'm not coming back, you know, but sure, I, sure. Enough. Black in the face, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just not that caliber of trade of of, mm -hmm. of labor work that that comes along with the term welding, right? So no, I'm not. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm not going to push towards it. Um, but yeah, part of me doesn't want them to. Uh, part of them. Part of me wants them to to wear clean clothes and and wear the same clothes that they leave home with and come back <laughs> with and they can still sit down and dinner and wear it only because it's a, it's a Latino thing and me I, I want my little girls to stay pretty and clean and you know what I mean it's um yeah. it's just the way even I, though it's probably going to be less money than they'll make but. Prob probably <laughs> but if, if they want to run the business when I'm old and they can take over and they can manage it absolutely do I want them to run the business a hundred percent 
<laughs> do I want them to work for me? Well, I mean, not as welders, but they can they can be the uh, the business managers, owners, and accountants, all that stuff all day long. No problem. Well, you got three, so you can play the odds. We can do like maybe thirty percent. One yeah. of them will be trades. One will be a lawyer, and one will run the business. There you go. There you go. And then I can just sit back with my my wife and <laughs> drink some mai tais on uh, the Costa Rican beaches, <laughs> right? No, you're not going back to Honduras. I I love to, man. I really uh, someday I'm going to. Yeah, I'm gonna go check it out. Honestly, I don't remember it, right? I was just way too young when we left, so I don't remember any of it. I got an uncle that's out there. Uh, mm. He's doing really well for himself. I see the pictures and images, and I'll tell you, man. When, when I watch videos of my uncle and my cousins all in Honduras, it brings back all that that same old uh, Hispanic roots. Where I mean, we're talking like he brings out the acoustic guitar and he's singing mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. and they're dancing all day long. And and you got palm, like, I don't know if it's palm trees, but big plush leafy trees out there, and it's always warm. So yeah, I got to get back out there. I I don't yeah, like I'm going back. I'm going back to Chile this year. Yeah, I just got to pay yeah, for holidays. Yeah. So for the people that are listening, if you're gonna be in Chile in December 2022, I'm gonna be down there. Oh, nice. <laughs> another plug. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, if you want to party, if you want to come buy me drinks in Chile, find me. <laughs> That's awesome. All you right, man. Well, I've had it. Sorry, right. go ahead. No, I was just saying, if you want to come to Brockville and buy me drinks, that's that's also okay. Well, I'm out in the uh, Toronto area every few weeks. I'm going to be there in March. March, I'll March. be in Toronto and Milton on the 10th to the 14th. I'll be in there. So I'm nice. out there every few months for my head office is there, right? So Yeah, Toronto's awesome, man. I, I love Toronto and, uh, and, and the surrounding areas, all of GTA, Mississauga, Brampton, even Orangeville. I, you, you talk to... Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the other day you were speaking to a guy with one of those really cool names. Diesel? Is that Diesel? Yeah, yeah. yeah I wish I had a cool name like Diesel, right? I mean, well, that, Manuel's all right. What's wrong with Manuel? All right. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. It, it, it works for a for a Spanish name, but I mean, Canadian, you're like they still get the Manuel or or the Man Manuel, and you're like, oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still get the, How do you say your name? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I I don't even try telling people my real name, Max. Good enough. Yeah, Just Max. roll with it. Max is easy. <laughs> yeah, it works. All right, man. Well, we're at the end of the show. You know, I just want to ask you another question before we go, and this is the one you hear me ask every time. You know, let, let's talk about uh, let's talk about little mini you. So, you know, you, you're coming across a kid that's uh, in the welding. Let's say he's been welding for three or four years. He likes it, but he's kind of hating it. He wants to get into the TIG game. You know, and he's he's looking at this food and and you know, this this type of food industry welding, which is you know very very unique. What kind of advice would you give that young welder in terms of, you know, how to get into that game and how to do it well? Come find me. That's what I tell him. I say, come <laughs> find me. I'll teach you how to do it, and I'll make sure that by the time you leave, you'll be able to go and get yourself a high paying job in any in any place. Stick to all food. right. All right. Food. So you guys hear that, Brockville, <laughs> Ontario. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know what? That, that, honestly, I, I, because food grade, uh, take stainless has been so well to me. That's what I, that's what I would tell somebody who's into the into welding or wants to be a welder. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's it's artistic. It's uh, it's finicky. It's clean. It's it's fine work. It's respected. It's a, it's a higher cal. You know, my opinion, of course, all this is my opinion. It's a higher caliber of quality, and honestly, it, uh, it's revered by engineers. And, and and that and honestly, engineers are a big part of our of our careers, right? Man, you're gonna have all the pipe fitters coming after you now, being like, "Higher Bring level, it. oh man, here it is." Bring it. I, I I trained a lot. Of, <laughs> I trained a lot of a lot of a lot of kids, a lot of students, a lot of co-op students, and and I've I've loved every minute of it, man. I love seeing yeah. these guys. I love seeing the potential. And some of them have it, and and some of them just don't. Uh, yeah, there's a place for everybody. Absolutely. There's a place for everybody. Everyone has their own niche. Everyone has their own stick. Like with artists, man, that's never been my game. But, you know, I make a table with, like, the legs slightly different. And I'm like, whoa, check that out. <laughs> I'm so creative. <laughs> yeah, look at me. Picasso. Like, <laughs> abstract art. <laughs> and, like, I even have art that people give me and I put up in my office. I, I like to look at art. I appreciate it. And by I look at it and I'm like, how, how? Yeah. What 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 is that? It looks like uh, the anatomy of a spine in that picture behind That's you. That's uh, Chile. Oh, it's my country. That's Mapa Chile, awesome. drawn by my cousin. So she works for the government as a graphic artist. So she got asked to do a regional map of Chile, but something creative. So what she did is she took the typical fruit of every region, and mm -hmm. the map is actually made of the plants. That is so cool. 
So every region has the flora of that region as part of the map. And That's so she's, really she posted it on our family group chat, like from Chile. And I was like, okay, you got to get me a print of that. I'm going to put that up in my office. That is sick. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, are you going to get to, what did you, uh, you asked, uh, you asked uh, Diesel to make you a picture. Was it going <laughs> to be? <laughs> I, you know, by the time he hears this, he's going to be like, hey, it's taking forever. But yeah, I, I am. I already said uh, we, we were working on the commission. Well, actually, I shouldn't say we. I have like staff that kind of does stuff for me, you know. So I had her work with him to come up with yep. a good design because I'm not creative enough. And so she, well, think pink uh, welding, Daniela. She right. was like, yeah. she's been working with Diesel coming up with a design. We just agreed on a price. It's going to happen. Awesome. I Good. just don't know where to hang it. I don't know if I should hang it in my office here in Regina, which everyone knows my office in, in Regina now, um, or if I should do it in my office in Milton. Because when COVID's over, people will be in the head office more and they'll probably see it more there. I don't I mean, know. I'm torn. This this room looks like it's kind of packed already. You, you've got you've got quite <laughs> a lot going on there, man. So I don't know. You, you might want to have it. Uh, you might want to give it some more. Some more space. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 probably right. You're probably and my my walls in Milton are like bare because That's I took funny. over for the old guy and so like uh, the last guy that was there, um, I cleaned out all his stuff and I haven't really put up anything new yet. Yeah, I'm sure you'll figure it out, buddy. And you know what? That's really cool that that you actually hired him to uh, or contracted him to do a design for you. He he sounded pretty excited and you sound like a really cool kid, man. He's the second person on my show now that I've bought an art off off of really? it's a bit of an addiction maybe and it's like yeah. and, I'm, and this comes out of my own pocket it's not like cwb's paying for it this is nope. me buying it right so <laughs> i'm sure you'll find a way to write it off <laughs> all right whatever sometimes you just bite the bullet that's right yeah man things no. cost things not, yeah. things are whatever <laughs> you still had a pretty good story yeah you, that, i really enjoyed listening to all the guests you've had on they've all been really neat man and i thought that right. guy was cool the, the under what kendall yeah. Did you know that like uh, two weeks after our podcast, podcast, he got into a car accident and almost died, broke his spine, both his legs. What? No way. Yeah. Find him on Instagram. Yeah. Find him on Instagram. He's doing all right. He somehow survived without being paralyzed, but literally broke his spine and both his legs in some crazy accident going to work. We were just talking about going to work on his podcast. And then I seen on Instagram, this crazy car wreck and I messaged him right away and we sent him a care package being like, dude, get better. Like, man, that's hardcore. Wow, man. So uh, Kendall, if you're listening to this, I hope you're healing. All right. Yeah, buddy. Hope you're, uh, hope everything's getting better over there. Yeah. Good Life show. Is short, man. You got to appreciate it. You never know. Yeah, buddy. You know it, man. You know it. Yeah. All right. Well, take care, Manuel. If there's anything you ever need, you reach out, you know where to find me. And, Hi. uh, any shout outs you want to send out to anybody? Uh, simple shout outs are just uh, to my wife and my kids. Yeah. I mean, uh, as all the welders are listening to this, we know that uh, our families are, are the ones that really have to go and suffer when we're working away from home. Right. Yeah. And that support system is the, is the wife and the kids. And they're the ones that have to go and maintain the house while we're, while we're away. And when we get back, we, we could be useless a little bit, right? We're tired and we just kind of want to rest or that structure, that support is really what keeps us going. So shout out yeah, to my wife, wives and kids. Yeah. 100% man 2019 I had 32,000 kilometers of travel in 2019 yeah, pre-COVID like I mean that's nuts and I don't know if I'll ever get to that with the world's changed now I don't know if it'll ever happen again but I mean I'm I'm going to Denver in a month like I mean it's starting again here we go like yeah, let's, well you know what let's, let's get it back to normal buddy let's let's get you know? things going like how they used to be yeah What's hopefully that? All right. Well, you take care. And, uh, you know, for all the listeners, make sure you guys keep downloading, listening to the podcast. Always appreciate the support and the ideas. Just like Manuel here, if you want to reach out, reach out. You know, I, I read every email that comes in and I reply to every single person that sends me a message. So I, I it's part of my job and I take it very seriously that I do this for you guys. So let's uh, let's all keep the community community tight and growing. All right. So take care, everybody, and always support each other. We hope you enjoyed the show.